Friends, during the past week we received a letter from someone who told us about a six-year-old boy who had been looking at college football games on his television set. And he was rather retired this particular Saturday night, climbed into bed. His mother came to him and said, have you said your prayers? And he said, no. Well, she said, get out of bed and say your prayers. And so he said, God bless Ma, God bless Pa, God bless me, Ra Ra Ra. <laughs> Well, you're in for a very, very dry telecast, so you can turn off now this particular telecast. We uh, will quit uh, talking about the subject, the glories of science, at 55 seconds after 25 minutes past 8. At that time, turn back and you'll get a good commercial. <laughs> in the meantime, this talk is going to be so dry that the sound man is going to sprinkle the microphone with water every three minutes. <laughs> The angel has found the subject so very heavy that he has loaded his wings tonight with helium to make him a little lighter. The subject, the glories of science. Science has come in for a few bad days simply because there's a fear of an ABC war, a war atomic and biological and chemical. And because when, think, when people think of atomic research, they think of atomic bombs and forgetful of all of the good that atomic research has actually done. After all, the abuse of a thing never destroys its use. Automobiles kill people, but we will not do away with automobiles. Now look and see some of the things that science has done. We will mention three. And in order that the six of you who are listening into the glories of science may be able to follow it. We will first speak of the benefits of science, and secondly, the purity of science, and thirdly, the humility of science. First of all, the benefits of science. And here, naturally, we're speaking of natural sciences. There are other kinds of sciences besides natural sciences. But that's our limitation this evening. And in particular, here, atomic research. First of all, we may derive from atomic research an entirely new kind of fuel. Presently, it costs to produce one kilowatt hour of electricity. It costs us in coal about $190 produce one kilowatt hour of electricity. By the use of atomic fission, it is costing between $400 and $1,400 to produce it. But this is becoming cheaper and cheaper. Eventually, we may get it down where it will be far cheaper than coal. And this is important when you realize that one-sixth of the coal of the United States goes to produce electricity for our homes and for your refrigerators and so forth. <laughs> Unsolicited commercial, always the best. Then in addition to that, it is possible with one single pound, just think of it, one pound of uranium, to produce electrical energy equivalent to two million tons of coal. Within 10 or 15 years, we may be making liners that will use atomic, uh, atomic power that will cross and recross the ocean year after year. Then in addition to that, there's been considerable done, for example, we've even given, did you know that we've given the hot foot to leather? <laughs> have been injected some kind of radioactive substances into leather with a view of, of perfecting it. it. may be possible also to develop food for the world without the use of green plants. And then, in addition to that, there is a, still a possibility that we may have ladies' stockings without runs. <laughs> but you can be sure the stocking manufacturer is not going to sell many of those. And 
then particularly medical research. There are, as a result of our experiments, there have been produced about 740 radioactive substances. Now, a radioactive substance is something like uranium, I mean radium, that is used in hospitals for the cure of cancer. Well, as an example of how important this is, just realize that thanks to Canadian experiments with cobalt-60, cobalt can be very destructive in an atomic bomb. If you wrap an, wrap an atomic bomb in cobalt, you create radioactive substances that could wipe out practically half of America. But cobalt-70, the Canadian experiments, thanks to that, it is now possible to produce for $1,750 the same amount of radioactive substances that presently cost $50 million. Think of what a saving that is for hospitals. 78% of the radioactive substances of the 740 that have been produced at Oak Ridge, our atomic plant in the United States, have already gone into medical research. Just a tiny little detail, for example, thanks to atomic research, it's now able to, we're now able to preserve meats. Potatoes that have been shot with gamma radiations have been kept four and five years without rotting in the slightest way. These are some of the benefits. Now coming back more to science itself. The purity of natural sciences deserves to be glorified. When we speak of pure, purity of science, we mean that science today is limiting itself to its own field. Now, what is the field of a natural science? The field of a natural science is physical reality considered from the point of view of measurement. For example, this piece of chalk is longer than this piece of chalk. That's an object on the subject for science. But my angel is not a subject for science. Why not? Because he has no quantity. Therefore, he can't be measured. But he's a subject for another kind of science, which we're not discussing here. I merely want to bring out the fact that science is concerned with reality in as much as it is measurable. Now, science has become very pure as regards measurement. Remember some of the older problems that we used to get in our physics, mathematics, about the elephant? Remember we were given the story of an elephant whose name was Jumbo, and the elephant weighed two tons, and he slid down a hill that had a, an inclination of 60 degrees, and there was considerable green grass on the hillside. That was our problem. Incidentally, before I go into the complications of that, uh, for the four of you who are still left listening to science. Uh, did you ever hear the story about the, the man who went hunting in Africa? Hunting elephants, and he saw an elephant, the clearing of the woods, and the elephant had his foot up, as if a thorn was in his foot. And the hunter went over, and he took out the thorn. And he let the elephant go. The elephant was very grateful, an elephant never forgets, you know. And years later, this man came back to America. He married, raised a family. Fifteen years later, he was taking his family to, to the circus one night. And the elephants were parading around. An elephant stopped, looked at him, reached out his trunk, picked him out of a 75-cent seat and put him in a $5 box seat. <laughs> For the seven who are now listening, because Aunt Mamie must have been called back, the old way we described it was in terms of elephants and tons. Now, the new physics, how does it describe it? The elephant says, the modern physicist, forget the elephant, forget the hillside, forget the green grass. All you have are two tons, 60 degrees, and coefficient of friction. In other words, they're just simply dealing with what they call pointer readings. That's pure science. And then for another reason, science is pure simply because it's gotten beyond mixing up in philosophy. 
There are some who say science is not sufficiently religious. That is wrong. Science has nothing whatever to do with religion. Natural science has nothing more to do with religion than it has with patriotism. Is natural science American or is it French? Doesn't make sense. It has anything more to do with patriotism than it has with nudism. Science is concerned with phenomenal reality from the point of view of measurement. A scientist may indeed be a very religious man, but it's not just because he's a scientist. A scientist might be a very atheistic and irreligious man. Maybe that's because he's running around with someone else's wife, or he's a fifth columnist. <laughs> but it isn't because of the science. We are now away from the old prejudices of a, of a generation or more ago, when scientists were impure, that is to say they got mixed up in other fields that were outside of their own. For example, in the last century, there were many scientists who became philosophers. For example, they said in the 19th century, the laws of nature are determined. Now, since the laws of nature are determined, then they went on philosophically to argue this way, as one of the French scientists did. He said, if we knew the exact collocation of atoms, we could foretell the day when the cross would supplant the crescent on the dome of San Sophia. Now, science has nothing to do with that kind of prediction. And another scientist of the 19th century said, if the nose of Cleopatra had been the least bit shorter, the whole history of the world would have been changed. <laughs> That's not scientific. In, in the 20th century, you do not find scientists generally getting into that field. The only one that I know of who has gotten into it was Eddington, Sir Arthur Eddington, in his marvelously scientific work, The Nature of the Physical World. Well. Eddington, like all scientists, knows that if you know where an atom is, you don't know how fast it's going. If you know how fast it's going, you don't know where it is. So, scientifically, he said there's indeterminism in the physical world. Then he became philosophical and said, therefore man is free. That does not follow. And then he went to a greater extreme, and the last chapter of Eddington's work on the nature of the physical world ends with the subject of mysticism. Mysticism? How did that get in? might just as well have brought in a kitchen stove. His philosophical, his scientific presuppositions and theories and hypotheses had nothing to do with that. So science is to be glorified then because today it's pure and free from philosophical prejudices. Now the third point, which is that science is more humble, we do not have time to develop. So, we will start in our conclusion. And now for the three who are listening in. <laughs> this is the great glory of science. De Broglie, the great French scientist, once said, the great mystery of nature is that science is possible. And Einstein, said the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it is comprehensible. These are remarkable statements. In other words, why is science possible? Why is it possible? We will try to explain that. Have you ever been given a gadget very intricate. And you said, what's it for? 
What were you asking? You want to know what his purpose was? You know what I saw the other day? A leopard-lined bathtub about that size. So you say, well, what's that for? When an inventor produces a machine, what does he do? He puts a certain idea into it. I would like to turn camera one and two on this other camera here in the center, but we will not because we didn't tell them to do it, and the uh, cameraman here is very bashful anyway. He used to have his picture showing on television. But here's a television uh, camera. Now, the inventor of a television camera had to have a certain idea in his mind. What did he do? He wrapped it up. He wrapped it up in steel. He wrapped it up in glass. He wrapped it up in iron. He wrapped it up in rubber. Wrapped it up in wires. And when we look at any machine, what do we do? If the machine works, we take the idea that he put in it out of it. And then we say, oh, I understand what that's for. When do you begin to understand, for example, your motor in your automobile? When you understand the relationship between the gasoline and the spark, the explosion, and so forth? And you understand it. But somebody put the idea in. There never was a chisel touched to marble. There never was a, a brush touched to canvas. There never was a dome thrown against the he vault of heaven's blue without some great idea preceding it. Every artist, when he paints a picture, has an idea. And then he puts, mixes his colors, his proportions, and so forth, until that idea becomes incarnate in color. Well, when this universe was made, it was made according to a certain idea. There are ideas in everything. For example, what makes a tree a tree? Why is a flower a flower? Why is a bird a bird? Why is a stone a stone? Because God put his idea into these things and then wrapped them up in wood and in stone and other such things. So that every tree, for example, <laughs> <laughs> Remember, only God can make a tree. <laughs> Drawings are made by fools like me. <laughs> well, not in the way that I'm picturing it, but inside. Of every tree is the idea of a tree, something that makes treeness. We understand tree apart from any individual tree. Well, God put rationality, plan, idea into every single thing in the world. So that we conceive, for example, of God putting the idea there into things. And then what do we do? Our mind comes along and our mind is kind of an x-ray. And what do we do? We extract this. And we get the idea of what constitutes a tree into our own mind. Now, an animal cannot do that because an animal knows only a particular tree. A cow knows only a particular clover patch. It does not know cloverness. It does not know universality. But the mind of man does. So that we are constantly drawing out of the universe the very ideas that God put into the world. Now, there are laws in the universe. There's a proton, there's an electron which is in an atom, which is the miniature of a solar system. There's uniform, uniformity throughout the universe. Why is it that two atoms of hydrogen, and one atom of oxygen, when they're united by an electric spark, will produce water in democratic countries just as well as in totalitarian countries? Science is concerned with the universal. Why is there universality? Simply because there are universal ideas that have been embedded deeply in things. And what does the scientist do? The scientist comes along and draws out of nature, draws out of the atom, draws out of animals, draws out of plants, draws out of men some of these great universal ideas which God put into things thanks to these universal concepts which he has, thanks to these laws which he has discovered, he's able then to produce what we call a science. 
whether it be a natural science or any other kind of science. Do you think, for example, that any great scientist has invented any of these laws? He merely discovers the laws. He does not invent them. There may have been some in the 19th century who thought that they wrote the book of nature. They did not write it. They are only the proofreaders. By this book of nature is, is a book that has indeed the first few pages burnt. And science is turning over the pages slowly, studying the pages line by line. And all that the natural and empirical sciences can do by their very nature is study what is inside of the book. They do not come to the author. That is not their field. There are other scientists to do that. Why then is science possible? It's possible simply because there's law in the universe, because there's order, because there's an idea, and because the scientists have discovered these particular laws that God put there. That's why the universe is comprehensible. That's the explanation of the mystery of it. And therefore, we have a kind of a new cathedral. The old cathedral, you remember, used to have cows and plants and the zodiac and the stars painted over their, carved over the doors in order that men going in to worship God might see there written the glories of visible creation. We have added a new kind of cathedral, which is a cathedral of pointer readings, of mathematics and its symbols, but it nevertheless is a cathedral that is not as easy to understand, but a cathedral of beauty. And beauty because God made it. Why is it we do not thank God? I think we ought to have a science Sunday. It's not science that has failed. We have failed to be thankful to God for his glories. And like the youths in the fiery furnace, the Jewish youths, we ought to sing, A benedicite, bless God. Bless us, O God. We thank thee for the glories of science. People of all faiths recognize Bishop Fulton J. Sheen as one of the greatest communicators of the 20th century. He was born in El Paso, Illinois, in May of 1896. As a young boy, he knew he wanted to be a priest. He served as an altar boy at St. Mary's Cathedral in Peoria, Illinois. At St. Viator College, his education and debating skills taught him the skills he used throughout his life. His unique ability at being natural and at ease in front of any audience was noted early in his ministry. He was ordained in 1919 and went on to become one of the best-known and greatly loved priests in church history. He wrote 96 books and hundreds of articles and columns. He broadcast numerous radio and TV programs. People from all faiths watched him on television because he spoke to every man. They always waited with joy for his goodbye, his blessing, God love you. It continues to give us joy and memories. Bye now, and God love you. Bishop Fulton J. Sheen went to be with the Lord in December of 1979. Fulton J. Sheen, requiescat in pace.